I'm so glad to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. So one way we serve you is through our daily newsletters. They're free, they're informative, and I hope you'll sign up at clark.com slash newsletters. Remember that key word I said? They're free. And something else you can do at clark.com is submit a Clark Stinks. Today's my lucky day because I get to hear what you have had to say about me and my really stinky advice. Also today, do you know the difference between a hard and a soft hit on your credit? significant difference you need to know i can tell over and over again from the way people ask me questions that it's clear as mud what the difference is between the two it makes a big difference on your credit score but without further ado it is time for clark 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 you were really off the mark on the lady with the tesla that had her wiring chewed up and destroyed by a rodent And not once, but twice. Yes, rodents certainly will and do often chew and destroy the wiring on vehicles. Not just Teslas, but any other vehicle they might get into. You said Tesla might be responsible. Why? If someone breaks your windshield twice, is the car company responsible for the repair? Certainly not. What she needs is someone to remove her rodent problem. If not, they'll continue to chew on the wiring. Squirrels, groundhogs, mice, they all do this. Larry from Iowa, and several people wrote in about this. And I want to thank all of you for taking the time to write in. Do you know, in my history of doing the show going back to the 1980s, we never, ever heard about rodents eating up a vehicle's wiring until COVID. And we had it so much when people stopped driving their cars a lot in 20 and 21, and it was it's... It's a whole new field for us with the rodents eating up the wiring and vehicles. And I appreciate all of you saying that I was missing the message and the mark on that. I wouldn't say you stink, but you certainly don't smell like fresh flowers. Ooh. Okay. More than the no-smell, two-week-old wilted flowers that will be in your house on Valentine's Day. So this was written before Valentine's oh. Day. <laughs> nobody, and I mean nobody, wants chocolates the day after Valentine's. My wife had an even better money-saving idea, and you can still give your sweetheart a gift on the actual holiday. Instead of buying your chocolates the day after Valentine's, buy them the day after Christmas. You still get a great discount due to the stores having tons of leftover Christmas chocolates. You just need to find a good hiding place place for seven weeks brian brian thank you so the chocolates thing was a joke (laughs) but the flowers thing is not a joke it is a long time tradition that my wife and i have had going back uh gosh at least 20 years that i buy her roses two weeks before valentine's day before costco doubles the price of roses and because costco sells everything at cost plus 14 percent few items are 15% of their Kirkland signature. And so it just became our tradition. And I mean, I was thinking about her in advance for Valentine's Day. And yes, the roses did die way before Valentine's Day. But you have to tell, we were at lunch and we were near a Whole Foods and I'm a Prime member and you had me go in with you. Well, because Clark Deals had a thing where (laughs) Whole Foods was selling uh, roses Two dozen for twenty four ninety nine. Yep. And if you were a Prime member and you had the app, and so I bought uh, Lane another set of roses to replace the ones that are already croaked, and spent five dollars more than I would have, or I had spent at Costco. But the uh, truth is, I. Don't normally I go into a Whole Foods because I break out into right. hives because how expensive <laughs> things are, but those roses are fantastic and they are still looking great several days after Valentine's Day. I love it. Clark, the air on this one is almost intolerable to breathe. NPs and PAs certainly have their places in the medical field, but please stay in your lane and do not promote something you know little about. Neither should be able to hang their, quote, shingles up without the oversight of a doctor. NPs and RNs with two extra years of online, or RNs with two extra years of online courses. That is not enough education to run amok unchecked. 
and this is from Charles. There were so many um, people who did write in about this too. Oh, I, I've had uh, over the years. I've had many, many uh, doctors who are my friends who and family, just, right? <laughs> yes, family members who uh, who get very, very upset with me about this. So, I my challenge to you in medicine come up with a solution because what we have right now obviously is not working. I use the example of what Alaska and several other states with vast rural populations have done with dentistry, where they have dental technicians that, because of the lack of dentists, provide uh, significant levels of dental care in rural Alaska, and this, as I said, is also true in many other states now, too, because there just flat out aren't enough dentists and then people end up with massive dental decay and as any dentist will tell you, that can lead to severe medical problems. In medicine, the lack of primary care doctors is so severe in so much of the country that people are not getting basic care and then they end up extremely ill later or die because of it. The cost for all of us as Americans it becomes huge if something becomes an acute condition versus something that can be treated early. And by the way, I find that uh, nurse practitioners and PAs are very, very good at what they do. And I ask you as a medical professional, and as you say, stay in my lane, you in your lane, come up with a way to solve this extreme shortage of primary care doctors for uh, kids and for adults, you come up with it, then great. Clark, you need to take a chill pill. Your rants are over the top and at times misguided. Today you ranted about how the big monster mega banks are cheating. Giant monster mega banks. Che Let's get it right. <laughs> are cheating their customers by paying too little interest on their savings accounts. How have they cheated anyone? What promise, contract, or agreement have they broken? The answer is none, not one. The people who really need a kick in the pants are the people, including some of your listeners, who choose to keep their money in those accounts. Saying those banks are cheating customers by paying low interest is like accusing an expensive store of cheating customers by charging too much. Customers have their agency in both cases. And this is from, with love, from the mellow man from Mesa. And my son may end up in Mesa next year at flight school. We'll see. Uh, anyway, um, yes, yeah, so when I pick on the giant monster mega banks, Bank of America, Chase, City, and the criminal enterprise impersonating a bank, Wells Fargo, when I pick on the four of them that have uh, a little bit more than half of banking share in the country, I do it because... I want people to be awake. I want you to be alert. And I want you to be aware that they are ripping you off compared to the rest of the banking world and obviously credit unions. So if I can just make that point as strong as I can and get you to take action and move your money and not get ripped off, I'm doing my job. So the- You uh, said ripped off again. <laughs> the rhetorical flourish of how I explain it <laughs> is to get people in gear to take action. Clark, you really missed the mark when telling Jason it was okay to borrow from his TSP to fund his Roth IRA. What you forgot to take into account was the double taxation as a result of paying the loan back with after-tax money. And when he pulls the money out of the TSP, he will be taxed again. Not to mention he is borrowing from one investment to fund another, which is kind of pointless, Jeff. Jeff, very good point and very interesting. Okay, so... The TSP that the uh, that Jason may have could be a Roth TSP, in which case you don't have the second half of the taxation you're talking about. Um, you fund a Roth IRA and you fund a Roth TSP in both cases with after-tax dollars. So using the money to pay this and having to pay tax on it to be able to get more money into a retirement account, unless I've lost my brain with math, should not cause an additional taxable event. But what it does allow is to have more money that grows tax-free for years to come. If it is money coming from a pre-tax account, then it, you're correct. If it is a traditional TSP, 
I am causing a tax burden to fund that Roth IRA that I am not causing if it is a Roth TSP. And lots about this one, too. I wouldn't say you stink, but how do you not know about Kayak to search for flights? You can open the Explore page in Kayak to view a world map and then select whichever months you want. The number of days of your trip, select a price range for the round trip airfare, etc. That way you can see if flying into one city in Europe is cheaper than another. I just use Kayak to find round trip flights to Europe for a great price. Lindsay. Lindsay, thank you. And that is neglectful on my part because I use Kayak Explore. I use the mapping. I use the pricing by months. And why I neglected to mention it is really a mistake on my part. One thing with Kayak searches, though, I want you to be aware of. Kayak will show some booking sources that I find to be on the sketchy side. And uh, that's something you need to be aware of is who you're actually booking your ticket through when you see something on a kayak search. I automatically eliminate from consideration a lot of those UFO booking sources. On a recent podcast, you told a caller not to pay property taxes with a credit card. In most cases, your answer would be spot on because the fee was 3.5% to use a card and it wouldn't be countered by even a 2% cash back. One scenario you missed, though, is where it is worth it, is if you need to make a minimum spend for a credit card bonus. Some of these bonuses can be up to $900, and the small loss you'll have with this transaction could be more than made up with from the bonus. And that's from Pete in Boston. Pete, thank you. I got to tell you a funny thing. My brother, my oldest brother, I told him about the Southwest bonus going on right now, where you can get a companion pass through, uh, I guess it's February of next year. We have details on that uh, on our credit card stuff at Clark.com. But anyway, it's an incredible deal, but you have to spend $4,000 on the Southwest Rapid Rewards card to get it. And he he was laughing. He said, "Uh, do you have some bill I can pay for $4,000? I'm like, sure. (laughs) So he could get it in a hurry. And this is a great example, Pete, of where what I would normally say is not true and not right There could be a specialized situation where you are trying to earn a bonus that you only have a short window to earn, and that would make sense. A few people wrote in about this, too. Clark, you're stinking worse than a restaurant having their grease trap cleaned out. You warned us many times about Venmo and creating a second checking account. I thought I'd avoid that if I used a credit card. You did not let us know that there's a $10 per transaction fee as well as a daily interest fee because it's considered a cash advance. Needless to say, I'll be opening an online account with a debit card I can transfer to. I wish I hadn't wasted the time trying to start an account with my cards and on hold trying to find out what the problem was. I still think you're the best financial advice guy, but wow, occasionally the odor is too much to bear, even for your fans, Elizabeth. All right, so... The credit cards are considering a cash advance. It depends on the credit card, apparently. Right. And there are fees as well. I linked to the Venmo fee page. For yeah, that. so uh, Venmo, if you pay by an account, which is why I've talked about setting up a separate checking account for Venmo or Cash App, And if you ever want to see if you can really play with fire, you could do the same thing with, can I say big bad sell? I hate to even mention it, but there are people who who want to be paid by that, unfortunately. You would want to set up a separate checking account at a separate institution with very small amounts of money in it if you're going to attach it to big bad sell. As the equipment manager of a major college football team, I know a thing or two about getting laundry clean and fresh. Yes, water temperature matters sometimes, and so does the detergent. However, soaking really nasty uniforms overnight in good old plain water can open up the pores a bit, and then using warm, not hot water with the correct cleaning agent can make all the difference in the world. (laughs) Don't fall for all the gimmicks. Usually use half as much detergent as they tell you, and things are fine. Soak, soak, soak the stains. Good old water is your friend Eric. And then this one as well. This is less about your stink and more about my stink. I took your recommendation for the Costco laundry detergent and couldn't figure out why my workout clothes were never smelling right. I switched back to my old cheap fave Arm & Hammer in the yellow container, and I'm much less stinky. I also get out of here with that cold water. You are seriously sweating during those workouts and don't have enough dirty laundry to do a load daily. You cannot rely on cold water. Joe. Okay. I just got a question for you. When have I talked about something that's had as strong a reaction as saying 
do your laundry in cold water only. Yeah. How many posts have we, I mean, it's been unbelievable. A lot. We all do laundry. Well, I still do my laundry in cold water and see, you know, I don't smell well. I don't smell that well. So I wouldn't even notice if my clothes <laughs> still stink. So maybe they do. You should tell me. I don't If my clothes it. have a stank to them. Never have noticed that at all. Okay. Your show is only 30 minutes. Please stay on topic and don't ramble so you can get to as many questions as possible. Also, discuss valuable questions, not the color of Clark's shirts. Thanks for the opportunity to give feedback, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, thank you. Um, I, I uh, apologize if it feels like I ramble too much. And the color of my shirt was something that has been a subject of a lot of posts. And so what we do is, you hear Krista say, we've had many, many, many people post about this out or the other. We want to make sure that people are heard who have the, the wisdom of the crowd who have been uh, particularly upset with me about things. And that's why you'll hear something that seems like a stray topic that should not be part of it. Or sometimes I just want to read it. It's, it's really kind of on me. Okay. And by the way, yes. there are a lot of Clark Stings, so I'm thinking that it's time for us to do another double episode next week. Really? All Stinks. I'm stinking it up twice as much? All Stinks next Friday. Uh, all right. Think? You up for it? I'm up for okay. it. Okay. Okay. Uh, coming up next, we're going to talk about something that is so confusing to people, and that is, when does an inquiry hurt your credit? And when does it not? And how do you understand the difference between the two? And I'm going to explain it to you because a lot of times people in the financial industry don't even explain it right. So I'm going to do my best ability to explain Credit Karma, which I think is a very useful tool for you to have in your life, gives all its stuff away for free in return for being able to make revenue from things they recommend to you. And one of the areas Credit Karma makes a lot of money is recommending specific credit cards. And they even have a tool that allows you to know before you apply and have a hard inquiry on your credit, it allows you to see the likelihood that you'll be approved for that credit. Well, they just got fined by the feds, three million bucks for deception saying that people were being told that they would be approved for something. They'd apply for it, and then they'd be declined. So this is something that I thought was significant because I've actually recommended the Credit Karma tool to you because, again, most of the time it works very well and allows you to avoid a hard hit. What is a hard hit? There are people inquiring about your credit status all the time that does not affect your credit standing or score. Let's take an example. People you already do business with, uh, banks, credit card companies, credit unions, they may be checking your credit every 30 days, maybe even more. And they're paying to continually monitor your credit. And the reason they're doing it is they're looking for oops with you. They're looking for problems so that they can shut you off before you become a problem for them. Those inquiries that you do not initiate do not affect your credit standing or credit score. They are what are known as soft hits or soft inquiries. And if you look at your credit report, if you go to annualcreditreport.com, which is free to use, and you pull a copy of your credit file from Equifax, TransUnion, or Experian, you'll see, and by the way, all three of them will try to trick you into buying stuff from them. It is free to use annualcreditreport.com. When you see it, you'll see all these inquiries on there, and you're like, man, what's going on? I didn't apply for this, that, or the other. So they could be prospecting for a new customer, and did an inquiry, or it could be an existing company you have a relationship with, or a company you have an existing relationship with that's doing that inquiry, and that is a soft 
inquiry or soft hit, no impact. On the other hand, let's go back to the credit karma thing. They say your odds of getting this card are excellent. So you click, you apply, and whether you are approved for that card or declined, you now have done a hard inquiry. A, an application for credit is a hard inquiry. When you're applying for a mortgage, know this. How many hard inquiries do you want in the six months before you're applying for a mortgage? Zero. Zero. I don't care what sign-up bonus a credit card's having or whatever is out there you're thinking, you know, I'd love new wheels. No. Not in the six months before you're applying for a mortgage. You want no hard inquiries for those 180 days leading up to applying for a mortgage. If you are applying for a mortgage, know that all mortgage applications in a short time window from as many different lenders as you want to apply to are not treated as three, four, five, six different inquiries, they are treated all as one because the credit reporting system knows you're not trying to apply to buy five or six homes at once. You're trying different lenders to see the best deal you can get on that mortgage for that home you're buying or that home you're refining. So they're treated even if you have six hard hits in your credit reporting it's only in scoring it's only treated as one hard hit because they all happen in that short period of time with vehicle loans same thing let's say you are shopping for a new vehicle and you get a loan quote from the credit union you do business with that'll be the lowest you get an offer from the dealer for uh, factory financing, there are rare cases that will be cheaper than a credit union loan where the, the manufacturer is subsidizing that loan. And then maybe you have another inquiry from a bank. Those three, all in a short window, are three hard inquiries, but for scoring, they're treated as one hard inquiry because they just automatically assume in a couple of week period, you're not trying to buy three vehicles, you're buying only one. And so that's why how hard inquiries are uh, filtered in, how they're scored, is based on the situation. But a hard inquiry, in any case, is one you have initiated, not one initiated by a third party just on spec or because you're an existing customer. How bad do those hurt you? As I said, with mortgages, any hard inquiries in those 180 days leading up is a troublesome sign to a mortgage underwriter. But in terms of your overall credit score and mix, hard inquiries are not devastating to your score. They make up a relatively small percent of your overall credit score. And if you look at a credit uh, scoring model, it'll show you, like at Credit Karma, if you signed up for it, It'll show you how many hard inquiries you've had, and it'll show you on the pie chart how much that's affecting you of your score, which, again, is not a lot. Krista? First question here is from Troy in Illinois. I've been considering selling my paid-off car before the used car market cools down. Carvana is offering me over $3,000 above the Kelly Blue Book value, and for my 2021 Mazda SUV, I live in Chicago and tend to only use it one to two times a month because of how walkable the city is and because my job provides me separate wor a separate work vehicle for transport to and from the office. How do I weigh the convenience of owning a vehicle over the annual cost of insurance, depreciation, registration, and maintenance? Well, so, uh, odd circumstance here. The used vehicle prices have been coming steadily down, but they're still elevated from where they were pre-pandemic. Um, and the market's going to keep correcting on used vehicle prices. So normally, selling a 21 ve you know, vehicle from model year 21, you'd get clobbered on the resale. Not right now. If you're being offered above 
what would be normal trade-in by thousands of dollars. And by your own telling, you don't find a lot of use for that vehicle. Then I think it's a safe bet to sell it. And if you find after six months or a year that was a big oops, know that vehicle prices are in the process of getting cheaper anyway. You could basically get a free mulligan, if you know, in golf, that you would be fine to then say later, well, I thought that was a good idea, and then replace the vehicle. Advice that outside of the last few years, I never would have given. Leslie in North Carolina says, I've inherited an investment account that is currently with one of the full service brokerage. Would you say that? It's full commission stock Full brokerage. commission stock brokerage. She's not giving the name of the company. I, I don't really care for them very much. Do I have the option to move that inherited account to another investment firm with lower fees? When I inquired about the fee I was being charged, they advised me it was 1.5%, but that the percentage could be lowered with addition of more funds. 1.5% is really high, particularly to be with an organization that is diametrically opposed to being your fiduciary, meaning that w the trades they do and the way they manage the account is in direct opposition to your best interests and is only what makes them more money. I would say you got bigger problems there than the 1.5%, which is outrageous by itself. And it would be very much to your advantage to move that money to one of the low-cost um, investment houses and away from this ultra-high cost. Uh, they're not shady. They're just not my kind of place. Sam in Washington says, do you have an update on how the Netflix password sharing crackdown will work? I have a vacation house where I spend about 30 nights per year. Well, I need a separate account. P.S. I listen to your podcast with the kids in the car. My nine-year-old loves listening and learning about the great topics you discuss. We end up having a great conver we end up having great conversations from it. My six-year-old passes out for a nap almost immediately. Well, I've always said you don't need uh, sleeping pills or anything. Just put my podcast on at bedtime; you'll fall right to sleep. But uh, <laughs> thank you for that about your nine-year-old finding what we do entertaining and. The Netflix password sharing thing, they've been adding country by country. They've been adding their new rules against password sharing. And we keep waiting for them to do it in the United States. And I think they're looking to see what is the amount to charge someone for another address that makes them the most money at Netflix and reduces the overall number of cancels they get. And so uh, what it looks like it's going to end up, unless you have new information, Krista, based on what seems to be happening around the world, is a different IP address will have a separate account under yours or a separate fee of what seems to be settling in around $3 a month. So at Clark.com, we're keeping up with this. And the latest information that we have um, for now is when someone signs in repeatedly, like I have a daughter at college um, and from a different IP address, they're going to send me eventually um, a code to verify that she's allowed to sign in on that device. And that, that is someone from my immediate household who's doing that. So, um, But we have a story at Clark.com, and we're going to keep updating that as we get more information. But what it looks like from other countries is ultimately uh, your daughter will be able to stay on your account, but they will charge you an additional fee, fee mm -hmm. for her to stay on the account. And again, what's happened other places, I'm guessing it's going to be three bucks a month. Okay. And there was an article I just saw in the financial press that is speculating that Netflix is taking the heat for everybody else. And that once Netflix does this, you're going to find other streaming services also are going to go to an added fee added into your monthly bill for people being at different addresses. Could be a second home, a vacation home, something like that, or a kid living away from home. The big issue is going to be non-relatives sharing an account. And how they're going to know they're a non-relative, I don't know. But we will certainly keep you up to date with this. And we work really hard to give you the best information on streaming services. 
which you can see at our streaming guide that we update continually and do a full update once a month to see the best deal for you and your household for streaming. And I want to emphasize again, the content that is available for free is getting better and better and better. Uh, one of the latest to offer a big amount of free programming is Sling that has a free streaming service now that does not require that you be subscribed to Sling. You're eligible for their free streaming just by having an account set up. It works through Roku, works on your phone, works on a number of devices with a number of the smart brand TVs. And this is where things are headed, where we're going to have free, we're going to have cheap ads supported, and then we're going to have, I guess you could call it full retail tier streaming services. And we're going to keep you up to date how to hold down your monthly cost of that streaming at Clark.com. And thank you so much for being with us today.